There you are. Much better, much better. How are you, Zach? Good. How's your day going? Good so far. I uh, I was good until I logged on to this call and looked in the into the camera and see the bags under my eyes that I don't get to see normally. So I'm like, oh, you're not looking great today. <laughs> That's okay. We all have them, don't we? <laughs> well, you're not as much. You're much younger. <laughs> the five cent Walmart bags under our eyes. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Are you at work today? I am. I'm in the office uh, trying to play some catch up and just uh, another day in the neighborhood. So uh, what about you? You've got a busy day? It's a busy day. It's uh, 10 to 11, 11 to 12, 12 to 2. <laughs> I was like, holy. But um, you know what? You can't complain, right? Because if it's not busy, I go nuts. Absolutely. And and busy usually fills the pocketbook too. So uh so busy's good and keep your mind going and, and uh, the days go by pretty quickly when you're busy. They drag out pretty uh, long if you're not. Totally, totally. Sean, yeah. for, the, for the listeners, um, first of all, what's behind your wall? Because that's pretty cool. Oh, I don't know. what. Uh, on the the... Left or right, let's well, see that. Mostly it's, uh, mostly it's uh, pictures of my family on the okay. credenza and, uh, and a couple of other small things that I've received. Uh, Teddy Bear is from URSA, the uh, Urban Rehabilitation Service Agency. So they deal with a lot of brain injury uh, clients. And yeah. and uh, they gave me that little teddy bear. Um, I've uh, been uh, honored enough to uh, be asked several years to MC one of their fundraisers. So they oh, did wow. that. Uh, pictures of my family, uh, a few other accolades um, nice. up top. Different things that you get over the years. A uh, couple that I'm really proud of um, would be uh, the p- there, the picture of uh, Parliament Hill. You can't see it very well, but that's a uh, that's a uh, picture of a project I worked on called Portraits of Honor, where nice. we uh, did a national tour to honor uh, and celebrate and remember our Canadian Forces troops that we lost in Afghanistan. 158 soldiers, sailors, and air crew. So that happened to be on uh, November 11th, uh, 2011. We were on Parliament Hill with the uh, mural of these uh, uh, lost troops. Um, And actually on that same day, I was in Kandahar, Afghanistan, uh, standing in the Canadian headquarters compound, uh, uh, honoring our troops there. So so that one's really special. Um, Over... There, I can't point properly. Uh, Beacons of Hope is something we started last year. It's a, a project that we'll be doing again this year on May 13th at McMahon Stadium. And that is a, uh, a project that tries to bring uh, a morale boost uh, to our, our Calgary Police Service members. Um, they are really taking it on the chin, uh, not just in Calgary, but in policing in general in North America. So that one is... Uh, is something I'm proud to chair, and um, I think we're making a little bit of a difference, giving a megaphone and a platform to hundreds of thousands of Calgarians who love our police, respect our police, to drown out the negative megaphones of a handful of people who are yelling obscenities and and defund the police and so on and so forth. And uh, and then up top, you don't quite see them. There's three trophies there um, on that shelf. Um, Those are CCMA trophies uh, that we earned. Uh, I produced, uh, I I didn't do it alone. I worked with a group of other people to produce a concert back in uh, 2005, I think, or 2003, one or the other, uh, called Say Hey. And uh, we raised uh, $1.8 million for the drought-stricken Alberta farmers of the day. Uh, They were at that time uh, railing uh, hay on railroads from Ontario because we had no hay. And so we called it Say Hey and and did an amazing concert in uh, Edmonton's uh, arena and then the next night down in Calgary's arena on a Thanksgiving weekend appropriately. Absolutely. And uh, so those, you know, we never expected to get anything, but uh, we, we got uh, three different CCMA trophies that year. Uh, but the one that was most meaningful is one that they don't often give out, which was the Humanitarian Award. So our group, our, our committee, uh, each earned one of those, and then uh, and then you don't see this one, but it's up on my up on a different shelf. So um, in two thousand, yeah, to camera 
2016, uh, Fire Aid, we did a similar kind of concert, uh, but this time it was for the, uh, the people that had been displaced up in Fort McMurray with the wildfires. And so that concert raised $2.2 million. So these are the things that I tend to, uh, they're, they're not a brag wall per se, because I have lots of celebrity pictures and, you know, da da da. And I don't put those up, but these sort of e volunteer, projects and even up top those all relate to volunteer things uh some a couple of awards from the calgary police service and and uh a frame from the calgary highlanders a regiment that i support and used to be involved with and they're all they all relate to charity uh, on that wall and except for my family so um, and then on yeah. the bottom underneath beacon of hopes what is that beacon of hope underneath that uh, that's an award. That's the uh, chief's award of excellence. So, uh, uh, so an award from the Calgary police chief, which we were honored to, to receive in large part due to, uh, the work we did on beacons of hope last year. So, so that's, uh, I'm proud of that as well. Absolutely, yeah. Um, yeah, it's, you know, not many people actually come to my office. My wife says I can't hang anything more on my walls at the house. So, <laughs> so this is, this is my little space where I get to, come to every day and and uh not many people see that stuff but uh, but it's a reminder for me and and i i think it's kind of an inspiration for me to keep going to keep continuing on in in that sort of volunteer philanthropy kind of role uh it's 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 people that we have such great philanthropy in calgary and it's people that that do volunteer work and do philanthropy in our city that i think is what makes our city so unique it's it's what made our city unique in the 1988 Winter Olympics. Mm-hmm. Our volunteer, uh, our volunteerism changed the way they do Olympics. Like we changed it here in Calgary, and and so uh, yeah, all that stuff is that. But I, I, yeah. Anyway, and the amount of volunteers at the Calgary Stampede—it's amazing. You know, the committees and the amount of time people put in to give back. I just, I love it. It's ten days, but what goes on behind the scenes is remarkable. Yeah, there's uh, about 2,500 volunteers. I think it's 21 working committees now. Uh, that might have changed slightly because mm-hmm. grandstand committee changed and so on. But uh, yeah, I'm I, I I've been proud to be a part of that as well. I've been a, a Calgary Stampede volunteer for more than a couple of decades. So it, it but it's fun, you know. Yeah. The, the volunteer work is is sometimes hard, and there's work to be done and time to be given and and all the rest, but. I can trace back all of my greatest friendships. Uh, a lot of the biggest part of my career relates back to volunteer work. It's all tied together. And, and, uh, so yeah, you're volunteering, but you're having fun doing it. Like I get to hang out with my buddies and, and meet other friends. And, and, uh, and at the end of the day, we do something kind of cool. So that's, that's just Calgary, right? And most recently you got awarded with the Queen's Medal. Yeah, I've got a, I've, I've actually had three of them uh, over my my lifetime, which I'm really proud of. So, but again, you know, you don't uh, you don't do this stuff hoping to get a medal or an award or a plaque or a, or anything. Um, they're all just kind of a surprise at the end. Uh, sometimes, not always, but um, that's not why I've ever done anything, and it's not why I would encourage anyone to ever do anything. If you're going into it with that mindset that you're somehow going to make, you're going to volunteer. So you make money in your business or you're going to network or you're going to get some kind of re- award or reward. Um, I think you're going into it for the wrong reason. I think you, 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 those are the surprises that happen and, and they're just kind of a scorecard. And for me, they are just a confirmation, I guess, that somebody noticed what I was doing. It's just, uh, it's it, it's not an award for me. It's just that somebody cared enough to to nominate or, or provide an award of some kind, or send a plaque, or give give a teddy bear. Like I I love that little teddy bear just because it reminds me. You know, I have another thing, Zach, and I don't know. If, hang on a sec. You won't be able to read it from back there. So I keep this on my wall, and all that says, whoops. I can't do this for a small reminder from a small friend. Okay. And it's a rock. 
And I keep this rock on my wall because it was given to me by a young fellow named Justin Shaner. Now, Justin's growing up now. He's probably in his late 20s, probably his early 30s by now, late 20s for sure. But when I met Justin, he was about five. And we were running our, we, I uh, with a group called Kin Canada, Kinsman. And the Kinsman started a lottery here in Calgary. Uh, There's 18 of us, and, and we started a lottery, the Kinsman Children's Hospital Home Lotto. And it's slightly rebranded now, but it, it, it's still the Kinsman Lottery. And we've raised about $3 million for the Alberta Children's Hospital over the years and bought some great equipment and paid for some great doctors to come and that kind of thing. But anyway, what, what does it have to do with this? Well, in one of the first years, uh, we made Justin, one. Of, he had severe hemophilia, and we made him one of our honorary uh, chairman. I think my friend was the honorary chairman. And then we were at the uh, show home getting ready for the launch of it. And Justin, being a five-year-old, he's, he's just kind of running around. Now, the thing about Justin, you got to realize, if he gets if he falls off a swing or if he just trips, he gets a bruise. Well, we get a bruise and we go, oh, we got a bruise. He gets a bruise and he could bleed out in in days because he has no ability to clot his blood. And so here's a five-year-old kid and, and he's just the happiest kid, but he has the, he's got doctor appointments and medical and just a life that no five-year-old should have. And I get sort of welled up when I think about this because he was running around just having a great time and he'd gone outside and picked up this rock and he was so proud of this rock. I don't know why, I guess he thought it was round or, and he came in and he's tugging on my pant leg and I'm like, Justin, I'm, I'm, what do you need, buddy? And uh, he goes, John, John, I, I got this cool rock. Look at it. it it's so cool. Right. And I said, yeah, it's kind of nice. It's round. It's it, That's cool. And he says, I want you to have this rock. And uh, so I put it in my pocket and, and he went off doing his thing. And I had to, I had work related things at the, at the launch of the lottery, some media stuff. And, uh, and I, I got home and there's this rock in my pocket. And it just reminded me that, wow, you know, like Justin is so happy and he's just so carefree, even though he's got so much to care about and worry about. So I, I stuck it on the plaque and I just said, it's a small reminder. So when I think I'm having a shitty day, I realized that no, I'm not having a, a crappy day. So that's been on my on my shelf for I don't know, twenty five years, I guess, twenty twenty six years maybe. And uh and oddly enough it still creates emotion in me and adds to my bags under my eyes. So anyway. You know it reminds you of the little things in life, the important things, to be grateful. You know, we can always have more, but we can always have less. And uh less doesn't mean less money. I mean privileges, benefits, everyday things, moving, mobility, you know, so we're so lucky, aren't we? Oh yeah. The moving mobility thing has been an issue the last week for me as <laughs> 57 years old. I've had a couple things break this week. And so my back is just killing me, but uh, yeah, you're right. We are, we don't realize that until we have a, a pain in an arm or whatever. And I remember quite often I would go, I would take a moment just to stop and, and it's a conscious thing you have to do, but I would take a moment and say, uh, I don't have any pain. Hey, my leg doesn't hurt. I don't, I don't feel sick. And it's such a weird thing to say, but when you are feeling pain, you know, that's all we focus on. So let's take some time to focus on a moment where, Hey, you know what? My shoulder doesn't hurt today. I don't have any pain because there'll be a day where it does hurt, right? So it's all that just being thankful that you said, Zach, and, and you, you know, I'm so thankful for you because you, you tell some, some great stories. You're, you're a great, you bring people together to tell stories and you, you tell your own and, and you're a great catalyst. And uh, I, I really applaud you for that because you're doing great work. It takes two, doesn't it, to make this happen? Well, in your case, yeah, you could hard to have an interview without any, without a second person, but, uh, I'd be sitting in my office doing paperwork if you don't give me the opportunity to join your podcast and, and share some stories. Well, at the end of the day, you know, I always think as, as a child, I loved stories. So when the teacher said story time, 
you sit in that circle and you get to listen. It was just, I don't know, my imagination went everywhere and I loved it. So I think now with the podcast, it's the same thing, just we're adults now and we can share things that in a time where things are so siloed, where you're doing your own thing, I'm doing my own thing. Um, we don't get to meet each other. We don't, people don't get to know who Sean is or what you've done, not because it's a brag, but it's more or less, you can too. Here's an opportunity in this day and age to shine and, and help others at the same time. And when I mean shine, it's feeding your soul. Absolutely. Yeah, it, it, it really is. It, 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 volunteering for me, at least, is, is a very selfish pursuit because it does. It feeds my soul. It, it creates moments and opportunities and, and friendships and, and, and achievements. Um, I, you know, beyond my family, my greatest achievements aren't what I've done in business. Um, there's been a few of those too, but my, the ones that I, I am proud of and, and, you know, talk about are, are the volunteer ones, the, the ones that helped a lot of other people that didn't just help somebody make mm -hmm. money. Sometimes you can do both. I've, I've been able to marry, uh, when we did a program called tough enough to wear pink for my client, uh, at the time was Wrangler and they wanted to do this program that, that married with breast cancer. So, you know, there's a case where Wrangler is using some charitable marketing to, to help a bunch of people, you know, those are great too. And, and, uh, but yeah, just pure, pure volunteerism, pure giving away. And, and it doesn't have to be at a group. It could be shoveling your neighbor's driveway or because they're a little older or they're away or just paying it forward, just being a good person. And, you know, you and I've talked before about karma and um, just, it, it pays you back, doesn't it? Like Absolutely. you started this because you were kind of feeling isolated during COVID. Isn't that right? Absolutely. Yes. And I actually had stopped drinking. So, you know, the social life kind of went down the drain for a little bit. Yeah. I stopped drinking when I was 21. I always joke and say uh, I was allergic to alcohol. I always broke out in handcuffs. So <laughs> it's a joke, but, yes. uh, but yeah, no, I, I, I stopped drinking a long time ago because it just wasn't making me feel great. Was it your conscious, your unconscious? It was mixing, you know, my, my peripheral on life wasn't straight. So it took a while to get to that level to say I'm done, but uh, this November will be three years. So Wow. Yeah, it's a, a big adult accomplishment, uh, being a better you for you. You know, in my case, when we talk about drinking, it, 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 I never drank because I liked it or, or really wanted to. I drank because of peer pressure. So here I got to university and everybody's drinking and you're not cool if you're not. And, and I, I actually succumbed to that for a few years. And, uh, but then I got my feet under me and went, you know, I don't care about peer pressure. Like I don't need to keep up with the Joneses. I don't need to drink to be cool. And, and it's funny because for the rest of my university career and, and, and years later, uh, I could hook people up to a polygraph that would say that I was the most drunk person at the party because I was doing the silliest things, but I was doing it sober. And, uh, you know, I don't think people need to drink as a crutch. Uh, some want to, and that's cool. But um, I think a lot of kids get into drinking or into vaping or into, you know, whatever, uh, just because it's the cool thing to do. And, you know, now, without getting too far off on a tangent here, now I think the cool thing to do is to be woke. Woke is the new cool. And so you've got kids five-year-olds, six-year-olds, eight-year-olds going to school and suddenly they want to identify as a cat or a dog because it's kind of cool. You know, in my time, if if somebody was to stand out and I was having this conversation with a, a, a good friend yesterday, he, he was the one who said it. He said, in our time, we had a few goth kids, kids that maybe wanted to look a little different, uh, paint their nails black, wear a certain kind of uniform or outfit that distinguish them and and that was their their way of standing out now woke is so cool that kids who now talk about identifying kids never talked about identifying in our day and and not to suggest that uh there wasn't uh like an lgbtq and i've forgotten a few letters a component when i was in high school there were kids that you knew uh they were likely gay and some of them finally admitted or or came out of the to themselves and to everyone else 
Some didn't. Some stayed very closeted, got married, had kids, and then came out of the closet. Either way, there was always that kind of an identifying, I think, a little bit. But nobody, I never had anybody identifying as a cat and bringing a litter box to the classroom. And this is what we're seeing in classes now. So the woke revolution, I think, is going to start to kind of feed on itself and, and kind of blow itself up a little bit in time. But I don't know what damage they'll do prior to that. And uh, don't get me wrong, I, I am for for all people. I am for inclusivity. I am for respect. Uh, I, I certainly understand the, the LGBTQ, uh, what is it, A2+. Plus. I, they've added a couple of things, and I am not fully versed. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, I don't care who you are, what your sexual preference is, what your thing is. We just got to treat each other with respect. How you but treat each we, other. That's what matters. Yeah. Yeah. And, and but it's got to work two ways. So I always argue and say, I will absolutely honor and respect your way of identifying, for example. But at the same time, you should also try to honor and respect mine. And I don't think it always goes both ways on that. It's like, you're going to do it my way or else you're a bad person. I'm not a bad person. And uh, so I don't want to go too far down that path. And it's just, it's a bit worrying to me as a, as a, you know, 57 year old guy, um, some of what I see. And if I go back back to defund the police movement, um, I went to some protests firsthand. I saw people walking up to myself uh, and calling me a Nazi and a piece of shit. Excuse my language, but that's what they said. And these are people who had never met me. But because I was standing there with a high visibility vest on, and a camera in my hand. I had a, one of my cameras and people just naturally, assu- you know, they walked up to me, and said mainstream media. And then just this diatribe of, of viral commentary. And, and I, I, I would say to them, I'm standing here minding my own business. I, I haven't said anything to you. I haven't, you don't know who I am. You don't know what side of this thing I'm on. You, you, you've never met me, but you're going to walk up to me and call me a piece of crap Nazi. And that's me as a civilian. You can imagine what's happening to our police department. Every time they do a stop, there's somebody with a, with a cell phone in their hand trying to get them right with the, the video. And I just feel so badly for our, our police that, that uh, they get treated so poorly by so many just because it's the woke thing to do. I always say is that, you know, it's just a uniform I have friends that are officers here in our city that are neighbors, that are people I hang out with, that, you know, you hang out in the backyard and have a barbecue with. It, they're human beings just wearing a uniform going to work, just like the Calgary Transit driver. You know, it's no different, but the eyeballs that they get, the glares, the... the I don't think people realize that they're going into other individuals' homes and not knowing what's at risk. You know, Absolutely. You don't know if Every time going to pull a weapon out at them. So, so people get automatically when they, when they do a traffic stop, for example, and they don't know, it's always that never knowing and, and people get, you know, well, why are you, why are you being so stern? Well, until they kind of figure out the lay of the land, they have a certain command presence right. and a certain, you know, why do you have to have your hand on your gun? Well, because I don't know. And, and anyway, it's, it's different here in Canada. For the most part, you know, I, I, we don't, I haven't seen, especially in our city, I'll just talk about Calgary itself. I haven't seen that extreme level. Do you think the polarization that is occurring south of our border is starting to spill into Canada though? A hundred percent. Yeah. So I think it's only a matter of time uh, before we start to look a lot more like the States than we used to prefer to be. And uh, that these are the kinds of things that concern me. And 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 yet it's all within a a huge umbrella of I love our city. I love our inclusivity. I love all aspects and all people in our city. Uh, I love that we're starting to become more diverse. Uh, We're we're seeing more diversity in our city uh, in in people. We're seeing a bit of diversity in our economy. Um, uh, You know, I love it. I I think we just got to find a way to do it in a, a bit more less polarizing, more respectful way. Um, because 
you know, my opinions may not align with your opinion doesn't mean we can't have a, a respectful relationship and we can agree to disagree or, or you can educate me and sway my position or I can educate you and sway your position. But I'm starting to see it in some of the volunteer work that I'm doing where um, this sort of woke nature is starting to seep into some of the volunteer stuff. And what it's doing is it's creating a division. And the, the interesting thing about volunteerism versus, say, business I always say there's a direct proportional relationship between remuneration and aggravation. So if if you're not paying anyone anything and the aggravation graph is starting to go like this, it'll hit a point where people go, hey, this isn't worth my time. Um, I'm not going to pay for this. Now, you want to pay me a ton of money, you can aggravate me a lot. Mm-hmm. So uh, that doesn't work well in volunteerism. So I'm starting to see people walking away from volunteer uh, roles because it's becoming divisive and uh and 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 I'm starting to see people who are starting to feel guilty for things that perhaps they've never had anything to do with they're they're starting to feel like well you know something that might have happened if it, you know years ago or or something that might have happened in a different geography um you know today all of a sudden I'm being painted with a certain brush and, and I've, I've had a number of people say to me, you know, I, I'm minding my own business. Why am I such, why am I a bad person all of a sudden? Because something happened in the U S or something happened a hundred years ago or whatever. So I don't know. The thing is, <laughs> but who cares, right? It, it, it doesn't right. define me. I might like certain things about someone. I don't like everything Jordan says at all. But I, I, I find things I enjoy about him that resonate with me. So some of the stuff about drinking and all that stuff made sense to me at the time. So I, I enjoyed that part. So I'm well, at- you know, politics used to be, we, on a day-to-day basis, you know, there's a spectrum of liberal to conservative or Democrat to Republican, depending on where you're living. And most people sort of sat somewhere in the center, maybe a little right or a little left. So me as a business owner, for example, and a firearms owner, I might be a little bit more right. But as you we've talked about, I love providing help to, to people in need. I love social programs. I love all of those. I love the arts. I love funding of the arts. So that takes me over to the left side. And it's only at election time that we come out and and declare our stripes. I'm a conservative or I'm a liberal because I have to vote for one or the other. But really, most of us were in the center. What's happening now, I see, though, particularly south of the border, is this polarization that if a Republican says something, the Democrats go, that's ridiculous. And if the Democrats say something, the Republicans most definitely say that's ridiculous. It might be a great idea, but because it came from a Democrat, the, the GOP is going to say that's that's horrible. Mm-hmm. And so to your point, um, I can like some things that Justin does. There's a lot of things I don't like. Uh, I can like some things that Rachel did. Uh, there was a number of things I didn't like. Um, so I lean, you know, politically, I lean more towards the conservative side. But not everything that the NDP did was totally wrong. Uh, there was some good. And you know, you hope that if you get the perfect election cycle, you get a bit of a Frankenstein. And that's why I like minority governments, because it forces the sides to work together. Mm-hmm. But you hope you get a bit of a Frankenstein where you get a little bit of the best of everybody and and uh, we have a better society. But this polarization is, uh, again, it's, it's concerning to me. So Absolutely. I mean, you know, when we grew up, Sean, you didn't meet people and not hang out with them because they were a liberal or a conservative, like it, there wasn't any of this. Actually, even just before the pandemic, I don't even think it was that extreme. You know, now no, friend, friendships and families are being fractured. Like, oh, you're a liberal, or oh, you're a whatever extremist, right? And you know, yeah, you can't win. <laughs> it's a a time where it's you know, do you just well, do you take the back seat and just watch this and not entertain it, or do you stand up? Because if you stand up, you get crucified. Yeah, it's it, it's interesting because um, I don't know. You know, you're right. It, it's 
dilemma. Um, guys like Brett Wilson have, have just said, I'm going to double down and, and I am going to put my tweets out and, and drop a few F bombs and, and I don't care. And that's kind of liberating. Now I've talked to Brett a number of times and he says, I said, how do you deal with all the vitriol that comes back on a tweet? He goes, I just don't read it. I put my tweet out and I don't bother to look at the comments. And I guess there's something very liberating about that. And, and, uh, I'm not quite there yet where I, where I just want to stand on a soapbox and, and really vent, but, uh, I'm trying to understand. I'm trying to find that middle ground and I'm trying to find that common ground with, with everybody I talk to. Mm-hmm. There's, there's lots of people that have swayed me, uh, away from something or towards something. I'm, I'm, I like really healthy debate. And, uh, when we don't have that enlightened, healthy, respectful debate, that's when I get worried. Mm-hmm. When we just stand on a street corner and swear, uh, we, we had a, when we did Beacons of Hope, we had a protester, uh, Miss McNally. And all Miss McNally wants to do in life is, is tell anyone who cares to listen that she hates the police and the police suck and, and so on. And here we were, we were having a family oriented event, lots of kids there. Uh, and here comes Miss McNally down Memorial Drive with her megaphone. And all she's saying is F the police, but she spelled it out. F the police, F the police, F the police. And it, it, you know, it was, it was interesting because she didn't have anything else better to say. Like had she wanted to come up to chief, uh, Newfeld and have a meaningful conversation, uh, the chief would have certainly probably taken her aside and had a great chat. He chatted with so many people that night, but she didn't want that. All she wanted to do is stand with her megaphone. And, and so, you know what we did? It was a great event because right at that moment, I was, I happened to be on the stage at the podium and, and I pointed her out. I, I went off script and I pointed her out and I said, that's why we're here because for every one of her, there's a thousand of you. And we love the police. So we, st- the crowd started chanting, we love our police. He's chanting the police. And this crowd uh, drowned her out and she left. Well, you because- defund the police. Let's just say that you defund the police. What exactly happens to our city? You get hurt. You need help. You, someone is attacking you. Well, when, when people say defund the police, some people are very educated when they say that. And those are the people I enjoy. Um, other people just think that we're just abolishing the police force. Defund the police never started off as meaning to abolish the police force. It's the wrong wording. It should have said maybe refund or, 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 uh, change the funding of Of police. So, so re hyphen fund the police. Um, in other words, we all know that there's way there's opportunities to do better policing in a lot of cities. Calgary is one of the leaders with mental health. For example, Calgary has a, a packed yeah. team where a mental health nurse works in a, in a car alongside a, a police officer and they go to specific calls together where mental health is an issue and they can help deescalate those calls. They can help get that person the real help they need because a mental health person doesn't typically uh, need handcuffs and a jail cell. What they need is, is proper mental health care and, and assistance. So those kinds of programs, not every city does that though. And, and what people were trying to say is let's take some of the money from over here and put it into these kinds of programs, community policing, youth programs, programs to keep people away from crime and to, to help those that are most vulnerable stay out of our jails. Because again, a person who's acting, you know, unusual on the street probably has a mental health issue, but, but, uh, yeah, anyway, um, but yeah, we, we kind of got off on a bit of a, a, a sort of a societal (laughs) tangent there. And, and, uh, I hope, I hope people find common ground at the end of the day. That's all I really care is that people find common ground and, and, and be open to learning different things and about different people. I think, I think uh, we've lost that touch through this polarization. You know, it's almost we have to pick a side and then that's it. Now you're divided. It's like, no, let's, let's try and open up the conversations and, 
and talk to one another like human beings are supposed to not yell at one another, especially on Twitter. I see that a lot where, where you see somebody without showing their profile picture, it's something else, a fake name, and they just give it to human beings. And I think, what are we getting through doing this to each other? What do you get? You know, imagine that hate inside of you to hold hate and anger. Oh, that eats you alive. And, and, you know, Twitter is the worst, um, because it, it, it is so anonymous. Uh, whereas Facebook and Instagram tend to have more of a, a personal connection. Uh, but yeah, Twitter, any, any troll can jump on there and you're right that, but what that hate does that they hold inside of them that you mentioned, Twitter just feeds it. It just creates more and more of it. It's a vicious cycle. So, uh, you know what people put your Twitter down and go outside, enjoy our fresh air. We have most amazing mountains and, yeah. and, uh, amazing, uh, scenery here in Alberta, like, Go out and get some fresh air and get off of Twitter. Like, oh, man, it, it, the cancel culture and Twitter and the trolls. And uh, it's just like whack-a-mole. You know, I, I, I block one and another one pops up. And I block one, another one pops up. So, um, But, anyway. you know, it's, it's interesting with the algorithms out there, especially uh, Twitter itself. Hate, you know, hate itself gets pushed up. People doing good or trying to do good get torn apart for doing it it's like you need you need the hate in order to grow you know i i use twitter very little or at least i post on it very little i i tend to read a few things from Mm -hmm. certain people that i follow um facebook is much very much a personal thing for me it's where my dad and you know can keep up on what the family's doing and and uh which is a whole other story in itself get my dad (laughs) onto facebook um and then uh and then uh, Instagram tends to be a bit of both. It's, it's, I, you know, I have my personal account, which again, is just, you know, it's, it's personal stuff I want to share with friends who may not be in Calgary or, or, you know, want to follow what you're doing. And then, uh, and then I have a, another one that I use for my photography hobby. And other than that, I, you know, I don't have Snapchat. I don't have TikTok. Um, don't have interest in that stuff. Um, you know, I do like to keep track of my friends mm-hmm. though. So I'm, I'm still old school. I tend to be more Facebook than, uh, than Insta for, it just depends, I guess. My older friends tend to be on the Facebook side. The younger ones tend to be on Instagram and, and such. So yeah, nice. social hat, you know, it's like all technology, Zach. I think all technology, the internet, social media, there are powers of good and there are powers of evil. Um, do I love the fact that, uh, internet and technology, GPS, like, you know, my ability to navigate now is incredible. Like I, I, I'm of a school where I, you know, you'd have to pull out a book and find the right page and, and find the street you're looking for. That's my dad. Yeah. Yeah, Well, I'm, and, and, you know, now there's so many things I can do on my phone. I was talking to a graphic designer yesterday and, uh, I remember when I first started in the agency business, what we used to do to create an ad uh, that would take two days, uh, because we'd have to send off for, for letter set and typesetting and so on. Now I can do it way better and nicer on my phone in about eight minutes. Um, so there is good use for technology. Um, even texting, texting is a great thing. I just always am shocked. I think you and I were talking about this before that, you know, I've, I've watched my kids in the same house texting each other. How about you go? find your brother and talk to him. Or, you know, I'll say, did you get a hold of so-and-so? Well, I texted him. Okay. Did you pick Mm -hmm. up the phone and phone him? No. Maybe you could do that. You'd have a a three minute phone conversation or you could have a text string over 15, 20 minutes. Uh, So there, there, there's good parts of, of our technology. And, and then there's the evil, you know, vile parts of it. And, uh, I think it's up to us as parents or or just as individuals to try to teach each other how to navigate that and and which parts to focus on and which parts to stay clear from. Someone that's been in the industry as long as you have, as a veteran here in our city, has it been hard to keep up with the amount of different platforms coming out in regards to, hey, a client needs... XYZ ad. Oh, now we got to put it or resize it for Twitter, resize it for YouTube and all these things. It's a lot compared to before, you know, it's magazine, newspapers. 
Yeah, it, it, the growth curve is exponential, and uh, um, you have to stay on top of it. And there's certain things that you might have dabbled in before, like SEO, where you just go, you know what, that is such a moving target, and it's it's so rapidly changing that that's a specific focus. So there's guys that that's all they do is SEO, and and um, we just go, yeah, I can't keep up on that technology. But you're right, it's. Uh, it's not only a lot of changes and new platforms and new software to learn and, and to stay up on it all. And I enjoy that actually. It's exciting. I love learning some new software. I love testing or digging deeper into software that maybe we've used for a long time. Um, After Effects or, or Illustrator or whatever, a lot of tools that we use in our business. Um, but what I'm just all fascinated by is the amount of throughput that we have in a day. So the amount of work that we finish in a day and the number of files that we touch, because before it was, we could maybe only touch three, four files at a time and get an ad done and then on to the next one, on to the next one. Now we're, we're moving at a, at a lightning speed. And, and to your point where we have to resize ads and, you know, we've got, for outdoor, we've got six different ad sizes for outdoor and, and, uh, you know, when we're, when we're, if we're doing a website, we have to bootstrap it to certain, you know, like it, back when I first did a website, it's funny. I, the, one of the, you were asking about plaques, the, the middle one that is a, yes. meh, yeah, I can't draw with backwards. I can never be a weatherman. <laughs> that one, Paul that Dunphy, one. Paul Dunphy, yeah. you got to admire yeah. him. I couldn't be Paul. He's awesome. I've known Paul a long time. Anyway, that one there is a, a nice plaque I got from the Calgary Police Service for designing their very first website. So I'd gone as a volunteer because I've been a police volunteer. And I went to this deputy chief and, and he was the guy that was sort of playing with this new thing called the Internet. And I said, hey, I'd love to do a website for you. And he said, awesome. Thank you. Here's the keys. God bless. And um, a great guy, Jim Graham was his name. And uh, anyway, uh, back then, in the infancy of web design, you designed one site, one size, right? It was just whatever that size was, uh, whatever the resolution of screens were back in those days. And, uh, you know, that is, I'll date myself because that was back in the days of, of dial-up modems. Uh, which you're too young to even understand. But I, I do the, remember that one, though. I did have dial-up. Yes. The first modem I had was, uh, I think, a 1200 baud modem, oh. and then it went to 14, or then it went to 24, then then 12, eight, 12 something, 14, four, and and then it got bigger from there. Anyway, I digress. Do you but, miss the sound? Yeah. Uh, bong bong bong. <laughs> <laughs> and then you're on. Yeah. yeah. Get off the phone. I need to use the internet. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? And so, uh, uh, yeah, now the, the, the complexity of, of, of graphic design, the complexity of creating visual solutions, our signage capability now, you know, back in those days, we had hand painted signs. If you did a billboard, usually it was hand painted by a company in Calgary called Tioga Signs, had a couple of great hand painting designers, so did Patterson. And now we then we went to four color process. It was easy. Then now we're on digital. So now we're designing billboards that change daily. Um, we're designing ads that change. We, we serve up ads in an elevator based on how many people are in the elevator, what gender they are, what time of day it is. Uh, so and what day it is. So so if you're a woman going up the elevator uh, at at six o'clock at night, you might get a to your condo, for example. You might get an ad served to you that is uh, maybe a female centric TV show. Uh, if you're a male riding up a different elevator at the same time, you might be getting an ad for Calgary Flames game. And I know that sounds sexist, and I'm not trying to mean be be sexist in that way. But yeah, exactly. but I'm yeah. but I'm saying I'm saying we deliver ads based on the people that are in the, in the elevator car. Like that's how precise it is. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, because there's little cameras in those, uh, in those screens in the elevator, most of them. Mm -hmm. And so there's a little tiny camera there and, and it looks and it goes uh, number of people, gender, general age, they can tell kind of facial recognition can kind of tell how old you are and you know, what time of the day it is. And it'll serve up an ad based on that criteria. 
you know, and then wow. it goes further and tells us, did the person actually watch the ad? Did they smile? Did they smile when they should have smiled and, or, or did they get bored and look away? Cause it's looking at your retinas and it's, and it's watching your facial expression going, Oh yeah, they smiled. So then we, we do ads where we AB test and we go, let's try this ad. Let's try this ad. Oh, this ad got the response we wanted. This one didn't. The science of advertising and marketing now is so technologically driven and the data mining is so technologically driven and the use of cookies and, and programmatic advertising and, uh, you know, the crazy part is how much information we freely and voluntarily give out by just carrying our cell phone. So, the, you know, we tell somebody where we are, when we went there, we tell them what we bought, uh, we tell them, you know, what what we like to search for and, and so on. So for a marketing guy like me, it, it's a gold mine because yeah. I know that Zach is very different than Bill and Zach is interested in certain things. So in the old days, we just run a radio ad or a newspaper ad and Zach and Bill and everybody else would see it. But Zach never really needed to see that ad. It was really Bill we were interested in. And so now we just give you guys individual ads. Wow. The targeted approach. I mean, even using Facebook ads, you can really narrow it down to ge geography again, gender, but just interests. What does someone like? And it's, it's remarkable. And you, you, you mentioned the last time we chatted, excuse me, you mentioned the last time we chatted, I think about chat GPT. Oh yeah. And, the artificial uh, intelligence. Yeah. yeah. What are your thoughts on that, Zach? It's getting really good where you and I could talk about something and it's just going to drop me a whole whatever. Or you said, Zach, I need, give me, I need a, a title for this. Give me, a, you know, 10 different titles, 20 different titles. Within two seconds, it gives it to you. And you're like, bam, that's the one. So in terms of that, it's great. I'm just scared for the next generation about creativity and thinking and and writing. Problem solving. Problem solving. I mean, everyone's going to you know bring a litter box to school and not be able to problem solve anything. Like, that's a scary time, isn't it, to think about? Yeah, it is. I, I, uh, I think that problem solving capability is one of, the things that concerns me the most. And I don't know, you know, maybe the next, listen, generations and generations and generations before me all said the same thing. Oh, this new generation of, of whatever they're, they, you know, they don't get it. Well, yeah, it's probably us that don't get it. I'll, I'll give you an example. When, when my grandparents immigrated to Canada from Russia, they didn't speak a word of English and they had a totally different alphabet in Russia. They had to learn English and they had to learn to write. My grandfather, my grandmother mm -hmm. had the most beautiful penmanship of, you know, but it wasn't unique. All their generation had beautiful penmanship because they wrote letters. Right. Then when my dad got into school, he learned penmanship. They, they focused on it and he had beautiful penmanship. When I got to school, we still learned how to write uh, uh, cursive. We learned that. And we were offered the opportunity to learn how to type. So they put us in rows and rows of typewriters and we learned how to position our fingers and type. And we thought that was pretty cool. Then they stopped teaching cursive. So now my initial reaction when my, my kids would, or, or staff member would have really crappy handwriting and couldn't, you know, I'm just like chicken scratch. Yeah. I get my, my old guy goes, that's ridiculous. Like, why do you not know how to write? But then I have to change my lens and say, oh, no, no, these people do everything. This generation does everything typing and or with two thumbs. Right. It, and, and they can do it faster than they can write. Yeah. And so kids are bringing laptops to school as a as a norm. So every kid now has a laptop in school and, you know, the notes are being typed rather than handwritten. So they're not the problem. I'm the problem is I'm just stuck in an old mindset and an old way of thinking. Um, I'm still so, old school. I still have, you know, pen and paper, write my tasks down. I just, I mean, in such a fast paced world of digital and technology and all these things that I think, you know, there's something about nostalgia of writing pen to paper. Technology is not bad and, and we got to embrace it. We got to figure out how to use it properly. And, uh, I think the young generation will be head and shoulders above us 
technologically, I don't know if they'll be head and shoulders above us in terms of how to how to create interpersonal relationships, meaningful relationships. So, you know, I have 500,000 friends on Facebook, therefore I'm popular. No, no. no. I tell my kids, you have acquaintances. Friends are people that you've probably sat down and shared a meal with. You've been in their home or they've been in your home. You've attended a family event or something. Those are friends. Acquaintances, we, we've got lots of those too. And um, so I don't know how the interpersonal skill thing will be. I think to your point, I, I fear that we're going to get more apart than together. Um, they'll feel like they're together because they're, texting, you know, like kids can text, they can maintain 25 conversations at one time uh, because they're all text related. I'm of the old school. I'd just rather have one phone call at one time, but uh, that doesn't make me right. And it doesn't make them wrong. It just makes us different. And I think we have to always look through a different lens and, and it takes work to do that. We have to go, how are they seeing this? And, and, you know, if I look at it through their lens, it, it, I start to change my mindset a little bit. Oh, okay. So that's not, you know, whatever, but you, you know, you talk about problem solving. I remember I had a staff member one time and I said, uh, did you get a hold of so-and-so? Oh, I haven't yet, but I will. Okay. So next day I circle around, Hey, did you get a hold of so-and-so? Oh, no, I will today. Great. Can you let me know when you have next day? Did you get a hold of so-and-so? Well, I couldn't find a number for them. Where did you look? On the, uh, I couldn't find them on the internet. They don't seem to have a website. I said, okay. And that was it. That was, that was the end of her problem solving. I said, well, have you heard of 411? Have you seen this book over here? And back then, this is now about 15, 20 years ago, I grabbed a white pages and I said, or a yellow pages, maybe it was one or the other. And, and I said, there's, there's this thing, but if not, you can just call 411. In other words, solve the problem, but she didn't have that problem solving ability. Like if it wasn't on the internet, it just didn't exist in her world. And for her, I'm worried, you know, um, that that's, that's just not the problem solving that people need in today's day and age. Before we get going here, Sean, what is something that a young person can do to start volunteering? They could say, I don't have the money. Um, I'm a nobody. Why would someone care if I need, I can help volunteer? What value can I bring somebody or some organization? Where can someone start? Oh, you know what? Uh, it's a great question, Zach, is how, how can people volunteer? How mm. can people give back to their community? And as I alluded to, it could either be in, in, in a few different ways. You can volunteer very informally yes. by just doing good deeds around your neighborhood or, or, or your school or your church or whatever. Then there's sort of a, a more formal volunteering where you could join a, a volunteer group. And then there's what I call transactional volunteerism, where I can participate in a, a specific event or a specific project. And I, that's it. I, I participate for maybe a weekend or, or a day, help clean up uh, the neighborhood or, or do a bottle drive or whatever. Uh, and, and, and you're done. Um, as far as, as far as people just taking that next step, um, there are a lot of opportunities. There are, are groups out there that are, whether it's scouting, if you're really young, if it's, uh, your church or, or, or religious group probably has some kind of fundraiser going on or some kind of social event that they might need help just setting tables and, and, and picking up plates afterwards. It could be something very simple. Um, Kinsmen, Ro Rotary, Lions, those are service clubs that do volunteerism in a more uh, structured role. So they meet every, Rotary meets every week. Kinsmen meets every second week. Um, Kinsmen, I've been a Rotarian and a Kinsman simultaneously. And, and Rotary, uh, at least my Rotary club, tended to be a lot of professionals, a lot of big hitters, like important people. Mm -hmm. uh, so that can be very intimidating. When I went in there, I was 20 some odd years old and the average age of the club was probably 55 to 60 years old. Very intimidating. Uh, whereas Kinsman, as an example, or Kinets, if you're, you know, uh, we have Kinsman, Kinet and Kin Club. So male, female and co-ed clubs. 
Um, they are the most, I always joke and say, we are the most ordinary people. Uh, we have people in there that are unemployed. We have people in there that have uh, physical disabilities. We have people with uh, mental disabilities. Uh, we have just regular folks. We have some guys that do run businesses that are bit, quite successful, but a lot of guys are just the most severely normal people. And uh, yet you come, we don't have any membership fee this year. We have free dinner every second week and you can come and, and join and, and, uh, or not necessarily join, but come and participate, feel what we're all about. Um, I had, a, I told you about that protest where the guy walks up to me and starts just spewing yes. stuff at me. Well, there's a, a kid next to me, a kid, he's mid twenties, young man next to me. And he uh, turned and started, uh, he had a camera and he started recording this interaction, uh, just to protect me. And, uh, I went to him afterwards and, and he uh, was born deaf. So he lip reads and, and amazing lip reader. Uh, his name is Chad and he's also a photographer. So we got talking mm -hmm. photography and I find out that he's really interested in shooting fire trucks and police. So cool. I'm doing an event next month for the police called beacons of hope. Would you like to be involved? Would you like to come out and maybe shoot some of it or whatever? I would love that, he says. So we became friends through that, and he did an amazing job on Beacons of Hope. And then I said, hey, I'm involved in this other thing called Kinsman. It's younger people, you know, people your age, people my age. You're welcome to come out. That's where I left it. He came out. Long story short, three meetings later, he says, I like what you're doing. I'm going to join and be a member. And he became a member uh, last Tuesday. And that was a chance meeting and it was just that step. So uh, anybody can volunteer. If you really don't know where to start, call Volunteer Calgary. Uh, I don't know their website, but Volunteer Calgary is a group that helps place other volunteers okay. for people who need them. So maybe the, the Grey Cup's coming to town and they need extra help. They'll bring in volunteers. For me, um, I joined uh, like... I, I, I contacted different groups as I was growing up saying, Hey, do you need help anywhere? I just wanted to give back. I, I grew, I grew up in a small town in central Alberta. I knew what a community felt like and I just wanted to give back. So I started just asking people, do you need help? And I, you know, that's volunteering. And I think our city will be better if we get uh, yes. more, you know, one, if we get one more volunteer uh, tomorrow, our city's better. Thank you so much, Sean. I appreciate your time today. Oh, Zach, I, you know, I appreciate you, man. I appreciate you bringing people together to tell stories and and to focus on the, the good parts of our community and, and what makes our city so great and the people who make it uh, make it great. So uh, I think you're doing an awesome job. And uh, I look forward to getting together with you yes. face to face where we can share a meal and share a drink and, and talk more. Mm -hmm.